welcome one and all to this fun competition Except nobody knows if there's any opposition Face so friendly, smile disarms, everything's good No cause for alarm, cause I'm like you And likewise the same, but for you this is work And for me it's a game, give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying Next round starting, believe that I'm playing Introductions not needed, been completed so to speak Since I always act familiar each and every time we meet We're not colleagues, you've never even heard of me But I'm just so polite and you're returning every courtesy We're a perfect team, racking up a perfect score huh? Always have my hands full, you always hold the door so nice. Gather info, you wouldn't take control at first Shoulder surf your photo surf so I can find your older work Brought a cooler small talk, conversation banter Really I'm just probing while I'm listening for answers yeah. Sure there's plenty policies but no one follows standards Thanks to all the folks who come Welcome to Welcome to the social network <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, really you, know you know, Bruce Hornsby, it, it, it ruins every podcast Oh man Come on, keep going, keep going, keep on. Okay, keep going. welcome keep going. to the social-engineer.org podcast number 33. Number 33! <laughs> See, that was better than Bruce Hornsby, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> oh, that just makes me sick to my stomach. I don't understand what's so bad about it, it's a good song. Uh, you know, it's it's like from 1924 or something, it's it's terribly old. Listen, the release date was... Okay, they don't have that on iTunes, so I, right. I, I totally messed up. Yeah, Never mind. Yeah, you did. You did. All right, I'm so up. As you can hear, Dave was with us. We thought he would be not with us because he was in Norway, <laughs> which we'll talk about shortly, but he's, he he made it. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Awesome. Awesome. Glad to be on the podcast again. I missed you guys. Yeah, I know. It's, well, we had you there last month, but you were just you know on your, on your chipmunk connection dial-up. Yeah, it was it was you know I was on a like an OC thirteen, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounded <laughs> like you were on a thirteen. You know, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was all you guys and not me. Sure. So. Yeah, that's why we can hear like Dr. Ekman, great, but you know you you were right. Yeah, you you the least common denominator. Yeah, exactly. At least listen, listen. It, everybody was wrong and I was right, and I'm fine <laughs> to admit that. Why is it always about you? You have to have hard wor- surgery. You me. have to go eat. You have to go hit the annoying noise button. You, you, you. Oh, Listen, I'm a, fat, I'm a fat kid. Fat kids need food. <laughs> and as you can hear, Ping is here abusing uh, people <laughs> as, as well. How you doing, Ping? Well, I'm great. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Now that I'm letting you uh, beat up on Dave, it makes me happy. I am yeah, just what, what is it? How did we ever get to this point, by the way? Well, because, you know, when we had some other panel members that got busy and couldn't um, participate anymore, we invited some new people on. And, and I swear uh, you strategically get people that, that will go against me. And, and Ping uh, happened to be a good friend of mine. And, you know, we were talking <laughs> one day, and I said, how would you think about joining me on the podcast? And she thought she'd try one or two. And, you know, it was just love at first sight. You know, here you are. No, this all came about because it's all about him. We wouldn't have to pick on him if he wasn't the fat kid that was hungry, and not just hungry for food, <laughs> hungry for attention. Listen, I mean, listen, okay. I, I, I you said like, it. Ouch. I, listen, I you said it. Ouch. 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 Let's, that, not, let's that, not even go into you, Ping, okay? I mean, that just, crazy, crazy evil complex with a soft interior heart that, that won't let anybody out, won't let it out because you're afraid of what it'll be. That's fine. Right. What it'll be? <laughs> But I, I was trying to come back with something creative, and I, I'm not good at I'm not good at arguments. <laughs> oh, Dave, I love you, man. What oh, it would be? Oh, oh, wow. uh, she's just gonna rip you apart, bro. <laughs> this this will this will make things better. <laughs> uh, anyhow. anyhow, I'm just gonna keep going. No, we gotta talk. Well, who put me on speaker now? Because now I can hear an echo. Must have been it's the same exact thing as before, dude. Okay. Well, anyhow, I hear an echo. Don't you guys hear it or no? We hear an echo as well. It's after you played that music. Yeah. Really? Do you think that there might be some weird thing that happens that when you hit the music, and then it switches back, I don't it know. gives the echo? You hear an echo now? It. Not with you, but I hear an echo on my voice. Now I don't. Now, right now, I don't. Don't keep playing the music. I think that's what's screwing it up. It's weird. Oh, I agree. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> well, as our ratings just dropped and we've lost all our votes for <laughs> being a good podcast. Yeah, professionalism. Um, so anyhow, what's going on new with you, Ping? Anything uh, new and exciting? Um, 
why don't we do a little drum roll? Not anything new and exciting. Uh, Europe was a fantastic show for us. Awesome. And that was just a few weeks ago. But I do have updates on our training numbers because we are having a slight competition between yes. the social engineering class and the SET class. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. Let's All right. Hear. So. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Social engineering for pen testers has a total of 12 students. Woo! That's beautiful. The class by Mr. Kennedy. Uh-oh. The Inside and Out of the Social Engineering Toolkit by David Kennedy has a total of five students over two days. Oh, I'm winning. Oh, uh, it's such... I'll, I'll get there, don't worry. It's such sweet noise. Oh. <laughs> You're winning right now, but I'll, I'll come in in the long run, man. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on a massive PR campaign where I, tr I tour around the world to, to make sure I get uh, this going. <laughs> Great. So you're gonna spend like eighty thousand dollars to promote a class. Oh no, no, I'm spending more than I'm, spend, I'm spending millions, man. This is a presidential election. <laughs> um, we also have two new review board members, uh, Chris Weisopel and Chris Rolf, who will be joining the Black Hat Review Board. Oh, two and Chris's. we also. We have a new director, brand director slash GM, Trey Ford, formerly of Zynga. And I hear he's awesome. He is super awesome, as uh, far as I know. Um, he's, you know, I'm not going to say he works for me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we all work together quite nicely thus far. But we're still in our honeymoon phase. He's only been with us for exactly two weeks. Yeah, but everything I heard about it from other people, too, is that he's really great. So yes. that's cool. I'm excited for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. To have a good GM with you that will probably make things a lot smoother. And I hope congr so. congratulations on EU. I heard uh, the Twitter was blowing up all about it. Everyone was saying good things about some of the. Speakers yeah, I heard, I heard the same thing. So right. Well, who who was the winner of all the speakers? Who was the winner? Yes. Do we have a winner? Someone that they couldn't stop talking about? Um. I, no, I can tell you who made the most noise, but I don't know about the winner. Mm. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Do you know? I do not. No? I'm, I'd be curious. That, I didn't analyze it that much. I just was, you know, especially when it was going on, I was watching Twitter and I kept seeing all these people tweeting about the, the speeches they were watching or what was going on there, you know. It's yeah, kind of, well, we had Woodfield Diffie there um, and he was awesome, but he was the keynote. So I can't say he had the most people because that's the one general session we have. So 500 plus people in the room, standing room only. Of course, he was very, very well received. But I'll have to go back and look. We're getting, getting together all the stats because we take room counts and everything. But quite a few of the, of the rooms were quite full. So we're very well attended. So we're pretty happy with that. And you get, um, and you get the, also the um, papers where people score things, right? Yes, exactly. So we're collating feedback. More on that later. <laughs> Yeah, I always like to uh, to know how the feedback comes in when we do our classes there in the past. So, um, yeah, Dave, that will be the next thing that we compete about. Yes, yeah. your feedback scores. You know, yep. feedback scores, you know. That's right. Sure That's mine. right. I, I already know I'm going to win that, so it's not a big deal. I'm sure, I'm sure mine will be a thousand times better. No, no, mine's, mine, mine's going mine's gonna to be 100% accurate and, um, you know, be spot on and... and you know, one of the big debates we're going to have is around social engineering deception. Make sure I'm right on that again. <laughs> so anyhow, besides that, what were you in Norway for? I was in Norway for uh, HatCon, which was um, a really nice conference uh, out there. I mean, really great group of people and, and um, great turnout. I mean, I was there with uh, a few folks like uh, Ian Emmett and Joe McRae and Renderman and, and a few other folks that I got to meet for the first time. Um, it was really cool. I mean, a lot of great people out there, man. Good turnout for the con? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it was, I mean, I think they had like three to 400 people. So, I mean, I thought it was really good and, and I really enjoyed it. How was the weather in uh, Norway? It was surprising. So, it normally it's supposed to be really cold, um, but it was like in the 50s and in 55 or so the entire time we were there. So, it was really good. I mean, it, I got nothing but good things to say about it. The only, the only bad thing I have to say is um, when I was flying into Newark, the, 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 um, the, the wind is absolutely horrible. So, our, our plane was bouncing all around and I hate planes. So, that was the only that's the only negative part I can say about the whole trip. Yeah, yeah, you you have a fear of flying. Severely, yeah. Yeah, so that must have been really fun because the winds were terrible over here. But wait, when you were in the military, didn't you have to fly? Yeah, it doesn't mean well. So I was fine until a bunch of Air Force guys decided to mess with some Marines on a C one thirty, and um, and so um, it was it was basically between the from from what the story we got from them later on was to see how many Marines they can get to throw up. 
And uh, they did a very oh. good job because it caused a chain reaction of the entire back airplane to just vomit on each other. So Right. Well, um, as soon as the smell gets out, right, yeah, you're, yeah, it's you're all, all everyone's stomach. Oh. Yeah, yes. well, actually, vomiting is one of those um, – one of those things that, that automatically triggers disgust and a gag reflex in most people. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for that reminder. Know, Let us they, not they, go they there. Yeah. Social engineering on vomit. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a next, a next report on social uh, using vomit in your SE engagements. If you ever have an engagement uh, where you we want... we got a new poll. Yeah, you know, if you ever have an engagement where you want people to, to feel disgust, then just puke in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> and that will get them to actually probably leave their workstations. And then you can hack their computer. Yes, exactly. I love it. I love it. <laughs> no, we're not going to go there. You know. <clears throat> but we just did. Yes. Oh, man. So uh, let's see. What else is going on? Um, we had our – the RSA speech that I gave is now up online and um, had some good views already. We just put it up yesterday. I guess yeah, I heard a lot of booze in the background. What was that about? Booze? <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but maybe everyone that's listening to this should go watch it. It's on SE Org and SE Com on YouTube, and uh, you can hear if the booze are there, and then you can did, tell me. Did you tweet that? It's now I, online. I did. I tweeted it. I only got like two people to RT it. I don't know. It wasn't that popular. I'm so. sorry. Dude, it's I'm RSA. Sure. All I gotta say is it's RSA. That's why. Hey, I had fun at RSA. Yeah, but it's 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 complete vendor fest. I, I I really get upset about the marketing and the the false pretense and selling a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. That's my biggest thing. Well, I didn't experience that because I was busy speaking in front of people, but I I didn't mind. I had a decent time. I met a lot of people that I probably wouldn't have met in other cons that I visit, and I had a lot of good interaction with some pretty decent people that are dealing with uh, serious security concerns. So. I think it. I think it's cool. You know, I think it was cool. But um, that's up there. Did you think? Did you think it was cool? I. I think it was. Um, yeah. Uh, let me see. Let me use a different word. It was cool. It's cool. Okay. Yeah. Let's make sure you thought it was cool. Yeah, I think it was cool. Um, we also have a, a. This is really exciting for me. We have a testimonials page now on the SE Com site for the class because the students were kind enough to send us their thoughts on the class. So uh, we have a little scrolling quote on the front of the, the dot com and. If you click it, you go to a full testimonials page. It's kind of neat and um, nice validation from the guys there. I mean, Robin is just a phenomenal trainer. I, I mean it. Like it, the fact that I'm so happy he's going to be able to make it the black hat for the class and do the training. He is really just a top notch, top notch trainer. The guy is the, probably the most positive dude I've ever met in my life. Is he cool? I, he he's more than cool, but he's cool. Yeah. He's 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 elite cool. He is. Yeah, ping, cool, but make ping, sure you ping met cool, him. Man. Ping met him when we were out in Seattle. Ping met him. What would you think, Ping? He's a genuinely very super likable guy. Super loves people. Very professional. Very polished. I don't have anything negative to say about him, which is strange. Yeah, I know the guy is ridiculous. He really is. I, I've That's never kind met of weird anybody coming from Ping. It is. I, I mean, but I, I actually looked like. There was wait, wait are you guys dating? <laughs> She's not dating. Wait, Robin's who's dating married. who? Robin is married, happily with two oh, kids. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. She's not dating yeah. Ping. I would only say that there's just a little thing that I some he had some little quirks, but they were still cool. So, but I mean, but honestly, normally when you talk about somebody, it's about ripping them up. So I mean, when you talk positive, <laughs> I was caught off guard. So something might have happened. I figured, you know, like you guys are not <laughs> dating or married or you know. <laughs> it wasn't all about him. That's the point. And that's his book, so yeah, he rocks. That was cool. But besides that, nothing, nothing. Made, you know what we we do have coming up is we're going to be announcing uh, the DefCon contest coming up. The DefCon SECTF and the SECTF for kids are going to be getting announced very soon um, on the SE Org site. We're going to be getting the signups for that going, and also we have a T-shirt contest this year. Dave, not what you're thinking. No, what? Not, not what you're thinking, Dave. We're going to have an SE Org design a t-shirt contest. We want people to design <laughs> a t-shirt. I knew as soon as I said that, it came out of my mouth, you were going to pervert that. So I figured I better jump in quick. <laughs> well, so, that's, that's how I roll. Yeah, I know. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's going to be pretty cool. Um, oh, and huge, huge. I know you guys didn't even hear it yet. I don't know if I could play it. Uh, maybe I'll do it afterwards. You guys can hear it. 
but Dual Chord did a whole new song for the podcast. Awesome. Yes. Have you heard it yet? I, I, he sent it to me. It's it's a, it's a, it's awesome. It's is it, is it is it cool? It's more than cool. Okay. First of all, it's dual core. So how can you even argue it, right? The song that's, just that's for cool. us. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's pretty awesome. The, those those guys really do tremendous work. So if you need to check out the rest of his music, dualcoremusic.com. He he just rocks. And um, of course, uh, our other sponsor, Spy Associates. Um, at spyassociates.com. They give us some cool stuff we get to check out, play with throughout the month so that we have some neat spy gear we get to do on our, have on our SE engagements. Um, what else? Uh, let me see. By the time this comes out, I will have been in and being in the UK doing a training there. Yep, I'm excited about that, our first overseas training. So our guests. Yeah, oh, you know what? Who we're missing? Jordan. Everyone's going to be asking. Jordan got sick. Jordan is at home playing sick. I don't really believe he is sick. I think he just was tired and didn't want to come on the podcast today or whatever. Maybe so. he, maybe he's got a girl. Very possible, I guess. Jor- Jordan, if you're listening, Dave wanted me to say something bad about you, but I'm not doing it. So, Anyhow, um, our guest today is Josh Klein. Um he is, I don't know how to describe Josh. Josh, like he describes himself as, as a hacker of all things. So not necessarily that he's always computer hacking, but he's done some pretty cool scientific experiments in, in his career, um, even in uh, animal training, uh, uh, behavioral training, and things like that. So he's always looking for ways to kind of dissect behaviors and uh, understand them a little deeper. So we thought it'd be cool to have him on and talk a little bit about um, about what he's done. He's, he's done a lot of speeches around uh, TED. It's probably where I saw him uh, online in a TED speech that he gave uh, about some cool machine that he made. And he's been all around the, the U.S. and the world uh, giving speeches on, on different topics and uh, nice articles and stuff. So we're going to get Josh on now, and then we will talk to him a little bit more about this. Let's see. Okay, we got our guest, Josh Klein, is with us. How you doing today, Josh? Doing well. Nice to have you on the, on the podcast. Um, before we got you on, we were just talking a little bit about uh, a TED speech that I saw you on. I wasn't there. I saw it on video. And in the speech, you uh, you were talking a little bit about some experiments that you did. But before I get into that, maybe you can just kind of give us a, a little introduction about who you are and what it is that you do so that maybe the audience who, who hasn't heard might, might be a little more familiar with you. Uh, what do I do? You know, it's always sort of a puzzling question. Like... Um Right now, I'm working on promoting a television series that I just shot for National Geographic that's going to come out in late May that's about awesome. innovation. Yeah, that was fun. I never, uh, you know, I haven't really, I haven't owned a television since I was 15, so it was sort of odd to be going and hosting a series. <laughs> but uh, it's sort of part and parcel. And, and what's, then, the show, uh, what's the show based on? Um, well, I don't know if you know this show in the 70s called Connections with David Burke. Nope. It basically was like a Nova-style show, and each show talks about how an ancient technology connects to another technology, connects to another innovation, and then all the way up to modern day. Wow. How it enabled modern day uh, innovations and what's going forward. So basically it was an excuse for me to travel all over the world and play with crazy stuff. Like I got to play with one of the original Gutenberg Bibles. I got to mess with one of the um, original Enigma machines. Really? Which was, yeah, wow. that, that was super wow. cool. How the heck uh, did they let awesome. you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we had to sweet talk some people, but... Uh, yeah, so got to do crazy stuff like that, which was fun. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, and outside of that, um, I'm looking at writing another book uh, on the effect of uh, reputational economics, or basically how large-scale reputation and trust systems are being changed through the scope and scale of the Internet, um, doing a lot of public speaking, and generally getting in trouble making crazy stuff. So before we talk about your experiment that I saw your speech on, I'm curious about this uh, topic of your book. That's a, that's an interesting topic. Um, do, do you feel that social media and the way that we interact, even on a business sense today, um, greatly affects people's reputations in a, in a in the business world? Well, yeah. And now I haven't I haven't written the book yet. I haven't even gotten a book deal yet. So there's no there's no real book to speak of. <laughs> but. Uh, but with, with that said, I think that there's a lot to the topic in terms of like, you know, it used to be that human beings were in small villages and you, you had, say, 100 people or so. And for most of human history, we were hyper evolved to make evaluations about those other people, you know, guessing what their behavior would be, 
making estimations of what their responses to us would be and doing valuations for trade whether that was like actual commerce or you know interactions and favors and now we can get a lot of that same information on the internet about anybody That's which which changes the game well hey maybe uh, if people are listening to this uh, some publishers or uh, book houses they'll be contacting you sounds like an interesting concept for for a book something I would read yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. So when I saw your TED speech, you were talking a little bit about uh, an, a behavioral experiment that you did involving pigeons. Mm, involving pigeons or crows? Crows, sorry. I was thinking birds. But uh, So what, what, is the, um, what is the basis of that experiment, and why did you, why did you decide to go that route? Well, the, the experiment happened, and given the audience that I'm guessing is listening to this, to this podcast – they'll relate to this. Basically what happened is I got in an argument with a friend of mine late at night after we'd had a few too many drinks about whether you could do anything useful with crows. <laughs> and, uh, and he told me that it was impossible, which really, I, I'm sure a lot of you share this with me. I find that very, very bothersome. You know, like, like seriously, we put people on the moon, you know, we, we invented penicillin. We've done, a, we've done a lot of crazy stuff and we're doing more crazy stuff and you're telling me it's impossible to train crows to do something useful. <laughs> so I found that very irritating and was irritated enough that I ended up making a vending machine that autonomously trains crows to pick up coins that they find on the street and put it in a box in exchange for a peanut. And, and how, I'm, just, I'm really curious about this uh, behaviorally. How did you actually train a crow to go out and find coins as opposed to like a metal tab from a soda can or something to that effect. How did you train them to? <laughs> well, so you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there, right? So now we, all of our experiments were with captive crows. We're working now on making a kit that should be available in the next few months that'll be available either open source or you can buy a, a free prepackaged kit that you can assemble yourself that'll, that will allow you to do these same experiments with wild crows. The crows that we worked with, that was the number one problem is that they they learn how to use the box immediately, like in minutes, right? There was no intellectual challenge for them at all. In fact, they found it kind of boring. And once they got done with the peanuts, then they would you know, try and break the machine. Or better, they would try and figure out ways to optimize, to make it easier for themselves to get the peanuts out of the machine, which involved throwing toilet paper, twigs, uh, bits of meat, um, cigarette butts, whatever they got, they would just jam it into the machine. So we had to, we had to, we had to go back and retrofit it so that it would sense things going through basically a, something which was a, a coin selector, so that only coins would roll through it. And uh, there's more that can be done in that area. Like ultimately, I'd love to use some sort of magnetic sensor that could tell whether a quarter or a nickel or a dime had gone through, and then ignore everything else. But um, that kind of technology is more expensive than a simple IR and a slot. That, that's really, <laughs> really fascinating. I mean, not something I would have thought of ever experimenting with, but um, quite interesting to to see um, training. I mean, I don't know if I would have argued. I think every everything has a purpose you could probably uh, utilize, but I don't know if I would have actually went as far in the argument to train crows or build that machine. So that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty phenomenal. Uh, did you then, I, I was reading somewhere that you then, uh, maybe not this experiment, but a, but a like experiment you did with other animals? Well, we've, I've done a bunch of work with different companies that saw, the, saw that video and wanted to do something use, you know, similar or useful. So we did a few projects where I worked with some catfish farmers who were having problems with um, basically had storks that were walking around the catfish ponds and eating all the catfish. So... That just involved transplanting falcons over. Did a project with um, talking to the BBC about doing a, a demo for a, one of their specials around getting rats, making shelters for rats in dumps so that the rats would basically be foraging in the garbage for any biomass and then come home and take a dump and their feces would drop down to the bottom of the shelter that we had built for them and you would then use the rats effectively to call all the useful biomass out of the dump and <laughs> you could then use as fertilizer right <laughs> so there's you know there's like, like you said everything can be used for a purpose everything can be used for multiple purposes but what motivated me to do this thing with crows aside from this friend um, writing my ass about it was to the fact that we're right now just trying to kill them all right we're just trying to 
get get all the crows that are out there to be dead because we consider them pests. But at the same time, we've built basically an optimi- an optimization machine for crows and other species as parasites. Mm. Like we leave garbage all over the place. What do we expect, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And similarly, like uh, the blood thinners that we use to kill rats are basically resulting in rats that are increasingly immune to blood thinners. In fact, uh, some of the sanitation workers that I've spoken to here in New York have repeatedly and from multiple different sources, so this isn't verified but secondhand, have told me that they have often seen rats going and munching down blood thinners to get high. <laughs> now, I don't wow. know how true that is, but the fact not, that it's not, not everybody, killing not everybody does that, by the way? <laughs> Great, Dan. What? Great. What? Great. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like a little community of rats like trading in blood thinners in the underground. <laughs> Yo, man, I got I got some really good stuff yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> like rat drug dealers. That'll right. Be, that'll be Dave's next job. So, <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Have you ever taken some of your experiments and brought them to the human side, like done any kind of behavioral experiments with people? Well, yeah. I mean, that, honestly, that's kind of where it started. I mean, in some ways, human beings are simpler than animals because uh, I happen to be human myself. Really? Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's I don't just play one on the <laughs> internet, but um, so I have a lot of access to them and, and a fairly decent understanding, or a hope to have a reasonable understanding of them. So yeah, there's lots of stuff that has been done there. I had one job where I got hired to do a project, and I was supposed to have a t- another team work on this project in their quote-unquote spare time. And if you've ever worked in an office, you, you know that that's sort of a mythology, right? There spare is no, time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what I did is everyone in, the, in this office was working in one way or another on projects involving Bluetooth, and the entire place was wired up with Macs. So I just I got access to their Macs and turned on their, the Bluetooth and then set it up to do a polling so it would tell me who was where in the office, <laughs> right? So then I filtered out for the five people whose time I wanted, and I found that every day at lunch they went by one, one of their members' desks before they went out to eat anywhere. And it happened to be uh, you know, a, an attractive graphic designer. Yeah. So I just showed up at that person's desk every day about five minutes before lunchtime, and you know, usually I had some pretense for being there. And then when the whole team came by, I'd say, you know, guys, I'm working on this project. Do you have any ideas about blah? And they'd say, no, we don't have any ideas about blah. I mean, maybe you could try so-and-so, but whatever, we're going for lunch, right? And I kept up at this for a while, and eventually when I came around, they'd be like, hey, Josh, we're on our way to lunch, so we can't really talk, but about that blah, have you thought about X, Y, or Z? I mean, I think X would be really cool. And after a week and a half or so of this, they started investing some serious time into it, and eventually they were putting in lots of time after hours working on it because just by pushing ideas at them, and then having them go to lunch, that became a topic of conversation, which they then became invested in, which they then invested a lot of time in, which then allowed me to get my project completed. So, I mean, in a way, this is, um, this is like a really uh, benign but extreme form of social engineering, because you put yourself right in their path, knowing where, where they were going to be at the right time, and instead of uh, kind of forcing them to think like saying, you know, you guys need to do this. You just implanted certain thoughts that allowed them to kind of reframe their thinking and and then spend the time that you wanted them to spend originally. Right. Like if I'd said, hey, give me an hour in a conference room to brainstorm over such and such, they would have said, yeah, yeah, maybe sometime uh-huh. later, right. right? But they were going out to lunch with the other people that I wanted them to be talking to about this idea. So I just presented them with this idea and let them go to lunch. Did you ever try to like inject yourself into their lunch plans to see if you could make that hour meeting over lunch? Or, um, you know, eventually they did invite me. Uh, you know, not not every single day because they were working on other projects, and it wasn't as though they were. You know, every it, it's not as though I met them that first day and said this idea, and they immediately spent the entire hour talking about the idea. Uh-huh. It was more that I was slightly annoying, but not overwhelmingly annoying, and my timing was really, really good. So how long did it take to go from zero to where they're actually feeding back ideas to you? Uh, it took kind of a week and a half, two weeks. Uh huh. So not that long. No, no, it wasn't bad. I mean, and ultimately we got the project done when we needed to. And I mean, they had been told that they were supposed to work with me, but as you know, 
they had other things going, uh-huh. right? right? So really what I did that, that I felt made it successful was to show up at the right time with some information that they then had a half-decent reason to talk about already, right? And that from there, they went ahead and got invested by virtue of the fact that they were going and spending 60 minutes with their friends. And one of the things that they had just been presented with was an idea that they could talk about. Yeah, that's interesting. Have you ever – now, this, I'm putting you on the spot here, but have you ever – kind of analyze what it was, uh, what, what psychological principles or what it was that actually worked in this kind of an experiment? You mean in terms of like actually scientifically designed tests? Yeah, yeah like why, like why uh, you, you know, I'm, I mean, I mean I, 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 the answer might be obvious, but I'm thinking, you know, like if you just, like you said, you went up to them and said, give me an hour in a conference room going over this, the answer would have been, oh, yeah, okay, you know, maybe under force they would have done it. But a lot of times they would have just played it off because they have a lot of other work to do. But by doing it this way, you actually got the same results. Maybe it took a little bit longer than what you would have wanted, but you got the same results and you did it with them actually enjoying it and wanting to help you. It sounds like at the end they were now coming back and feeding you ideas um, that, that sounded exactly like what you needed and what you were looking for in the beginning. Well, yeah. I mean in the end they were asking for me to stay after work for a couple hours to work on the project with them. <laughs> Right, yeah. so so I consider that a win. I mean, alternately, I could have chased them for months and months, hoping to get some time from them. And instead, they came up with some ideas that I thought fit the profile of what needed to get done. I went to bat for them to get them additional resources to get their ideas made, and they then produced them. Right now, I could have gone in and said, I think one of the things that would have broken it is if I'd gone to them and said, "Here's my idea. I want you to execute on it." While you're at lunch, think about ways to execute on it. I don't think that that would have worked, right? Right. But instead, I said, here's an opportunity. I was thinking about, hey, what do you think? And for them, that was extremely non-threatening and a potential opportunity for them to express themselves or to implement their own ideas. So then I became the gatekeeper for them to get the resources they needed to actualize it or actualize something that they actually wanted on their own. Uh So by the end of the actual engagement... They needed you to implement ideas that they had for the project you wanted them to work on. Yeah. Wow. I mean, they needed, they needed permission to, to do it with the client, and they needed some resources to make it happen. So, yeah, and I was the one in charge of the project. Yeah, what a perfect reframing, really. If you think about it, that was like a whole reframing uh, of their previous mental condition of being too busy. And over a week and a half, you were able to reframe them to not only want to devote time to it, but then to actually inviting you uh, to stay after work in order to do that. That's pretty cool. Um, it was useful. In, as an answer to that, and something that I found very interesting was the fact that I found where and where and when I could find these people just by doing a log analysis of you know the Bluetooth on the computers, which were basically tracking where their laptops and phones were. Um, when that came out that I was doing that, because I continued to use that tool, you know, if I needed to find so-and-so, I could do a pretty good estimation based on past behavior about where they would be when, or I could just look up real time and tell where in the office they were. And the office was constructed such that there were very few lines of sight, and it was diff- you know you had to wander around for quite a while to find anybody. So eventually, I became it became known that Josh could find anybody at any time, and he would just come and hunt you down wherever you were. And then eventually, word got out about how I was doing it, and when when word got out about how I was doing it, people got really pissed off. Uh huh. They were really not happy about that, and so I had to close the system down. And you know, it would have been better if I'd not brought it up. But there was a privacy concern there, so <laughs> found that interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, did, I was going to ask about that, but I, I I kind of forgot that point. But that's a good one. So you were tracking people through their Bluetooth devices, and they got a little ticked off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's quite interesting. Um, did you have a, uh, maybe another uh, social experiment or behavioral experiment you did with people? Well, that was a good one. Well, I guess, I mean, the other one for me in my mind is training people around email and messaging. Mm-hmm. So, for example, my mom is, is laid back. She's really relaxed. And she, she, she's often told me she doesn't want to be a burden to me and doesn't want to, like, waste a lot of my time because she knows that I'm busy. So getting my mom to chat you know, it was a little bit difficult. So I taught her how to use um, instant messaging, right? So when I'm ever online, she can contact me wherever I am. So if she wants to talk, I'm around. My dad, on the other hand, is really verbose. 
And so his emails are like eight paragraph monstrosities, right? <laughs> so I taught him to use text messaging, which limits him to 140 characters at a shot. So now if he wants to communicate to me, he gets 140 characters and that's it. And it works out really nicely. And it took them like two years to figure out that I had been teaching them different ways to communicate to me. And now they both have access to both. But it was sort of funny for a while there. I'd really optimized my parents by uh, medium. And how, and how, uh, like how was the, um, I don't know if you want to give away all the secrets, but I mean training them, how did that, how did that work? Because I mean you're now, if your dad's personality type is when he starts typing, he wants to type you eight paragraphs. Um, you know, changing that could be a very difficult process. I would imagine if it's within his personality type to actually talk that much or do, you know, talk to you that way. Well, I mean, basically, when he texts, he'll limit himself for what he's communicating about unless he thinks that we need to chat and then we'll set up a phone call. Uh -huh. But, I mean, the way that we set it up is that, you know, my dad's an early adopter. And so he would try doing instant messaging with me and whatnot, and I would just be difficult to get a hold of. Like he would send me messages and I would wait an hour and then reply, right? And so he found that that was not an effective way to communicate. Whereas if my mom t communicated with me on instant messenger, I would reply right away. And she would find that that was a successful way to do it. <laughs> well, my mom was not inclined to typing on the phone. You know, she's not an early adopter the same way my dad is. So that just wasn't really an issue there. And for my dad, he felt that it was kind of cool to be able to do this text messaging stuff. And he'd gotten the latest phones and whatnot. And I replied right away to his text messages. So it just taught him that that was a good way to get a satisfactory response. <laughs> but so, you can do this. You can do the same thing with email, right? Like. I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you've noticed that you can train people to respond certain ways on email that are optimized for how you want it to work, right? Sure. Yeah, tell us more about that. Well, I mean, my favorite is that a lot of people I know, particularly if they're older, will try and send you email that's written like a letter, which is really sweet. But, you know, I get three or 400 emails a day, and if I wanted to get a letter, then I, I would, you know, call you on the phone or I'd ask you to do something over the post, I guess. But... So my method for that is to, to just do a search for the first question mark in the email and answer that hmm. and then send it back. So they may have sent six paragraphs in which there are three questions buried, but I just do a search for the first question and reply to that. Then they have to send me, the, send me a version of the email again, right? And I'll just answer the first question of that unless there's a bullet point or a couple one-sentence questions. And in pretty short order, you get people that are sending you emails that have an introductory sentence and then three bullet point questions, which is a lot easier to batch process than a full on like letter with lots of context, etc. And do you find that people are willing to make those adjustments quickly or does it take a while to retrain an individual you're working with to email that way? Well, I've always found that it works pretty quickly. I don't know if I'd say they're willing, though. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the responses I've gotten have not always been, gee, it's so nice that you're not answering my questions or that you're enormously brief in your replies. Like, there's been some criticism there. But overall, I think that the benefit is worth the cost because it means that I'm now exchanging information as effectively as possible and moving projects forward. Now, obviously... You know, if someone if someone's mom just died, and one of the questions is, "Can you be at the funeral?" and "Can you also drive my dad?" Well, you don't want to skip that second question, right? Like, like you probably want to spend a little more time on that particular right, email. Right. <laughs> but for a lot of business co correspondence, I found that that works pretty well. Huh. Interesting. That's an interesting concept. Um, so I was in. I think it was in the um, one TED speech that you gave. You told a story about a young guy who was working for a yacht company and he had uh, started answering customers questions about maybe problems they had with their boat because he was he wasn't in tech support but he was like a sales guy or something like that right oh yeah yeah it, yeah he was he was working at a yacht company and uh yeah, yeah that that's such a it's such a telling story for how businesses are have not quite clued in yet <laughs> yeah, I, so I find he, I found this story interesting. Um, maybe you could tell us the story. I'll tell you why because it, to, to me it has such a direct implication to social engineering. Right. Well, so and this is about the 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 young guy that just gets out of school and he goes and works for the the yacht the yacht company, right? Yep. Okay. So 
young guy, gets out of school, goes works for a yacht company. They say, well, you are completely new and you don't know anything, so we're putting you at the very most basic job. You need to um, you know, work in the mailroom or whatever it is, whatever menial job there is. Well, he's really enterprising and really a go-getter, so he starts spending a lot of time online finding out about this yacht company. And he discovers that there's a bunch of chat rooms and news groups and whatnot. And there's one in particular where people who buy these yachts go to try and figure out how to solve problems with their yachts. Because this yacht, it, you know, obviously yacht owners, if you can buy a yacht, a yacht is a pretty premium product. Okay. So, you know, yeah, I mean, not everyone has one. <laughs> and the support system that the yacht company had was difficult to use. Now, partly it was difficult to use by design. Because if you own a yacht and you need to get it serviced by the yacht company, it behooves the yacht company to limit the number of repairs that they actually do. It limits their costs, right? As long as they're not losing customers. Right. So what he did is he went online and found that there are all these people that were trying to find ways to fix these problems with their yachts without having to go through the support system of the yacht company. And because he was actually at the yacht company, he could walk down to the warehouse and ask the engineers and come back and, and post solutions to these things. So that's what he did, and in very short order, these yacht owners were basically using him as the go-to guy because if you can go online and post a message and an hour later get an answer that you can do yourself or you can do very cheaply, that beats the crap out of having to go and submit a ticket and wait a week while your boat is leaking. Right, right? yeah. So the, he did this for a few weeks and it became very, very popular. All these people were really, you know, really stoked about it. I have no idea if that affected sales of the yachts or not. But what happened was that he got called into the CEO's office, and uh, turns out the CEO and the, the head of marketing were there. And he was thinking, all right, awesome, I'm going to get my promotion now, you know, because I've just um, super improved this company and I'm doing a lot to like increase satisfaction by our customers. And, you know, this is. This is awesome. This is what a company really wants, right? And I'm going to get promoted. And he walked in, and the CEO asked him if he'd been doing all this, and he said yes. And he said, "Well, have you cleared all this with our, you know, Bob Smith here, our head of marketing?" He said, "Well, no." And they said, "Well, you need to stop doing it, or we're going to fire you. You are not allowed to be on the internet anymore." So that sucked, right? So he went so he went back to this news group or the forum or whatever it was where all these yacht owners were getting useful answers from him and explained this to them and signed off and didn't go back. Now this was a forum, right? He developed a forum online. Yeah, I don't know if it was a forum that he developed or not, but uh, But either way, I mean, it was like an online area yeah. where people can ask and he posted answers. Exactly. Yeah. So <clears throat> a short while later, the CEO, well, I, don't, I, you know, I think it was a, a couple of weeks, the CEO of the company got a phone call, phone call or an email, I don't remember which it was, by someone, one of the yacht owners who said, you know, hey, is so-and-so an employee of yours? And he said, yes. He said, well, and he, you know, he was answering lots of, of uh, yacht owners' questions on this forum, and the CEO said yes. He said, well, we formed an LLC to do all of the support for owners of this of your yachts and we're electing him president and if you don't like it then we're all going to boycott your company and ask all of our friends to boycott your company and if you think that that's too small a number to affect sales of your company you've got something else coming so that's what happened this guy got basically brought out of the mailroom and made CEO of this small company which then handled all the support requests for this yacht building company oh, because man. Because he answered their questions and treated them the way that they wanted to be treated. Well, now that's, that's what I see as being a major shift in how the, the consumer-seller relationship is, is changing, right? Yeah, I, I actually loved that story when I heard it because you know, coming, from it, uh, coming at this from a non-business angle but more of a SE angle, um, what I really started to think about is in my, I have a class that we teach – uh, the basics of like how to do use social engineering skills on a penetration test, and my co-trainer is a guy who um, who wrote a book. It's it's entitled "It's Not All About Me: Ten the Ten Steps to Building Rapport," and and basically the biggest thing about building rapport and him is is make everything about the other person. 
Don't make it about you. Right? So if, if you want to build rapport with someone and you talk about their likes, their needs, their wants, then they feel good and you build rapport with that person. As soon as you start focusing on yourself, then uh, you, know, you, you basically ruin rapport. It has the opposite effect because people don't really care. They don't want to hear all about you. They want to hear about themselves. <laughs> and, um, and that's what this, this kid was doing. Right, I mean, without really knowing it and asking for nothing in return. That's the other part of it. Is true rapport is you don't do that and then follow it up with, uh, okay, hey, I was really great with you. Now give me these ten things. Um, and and that's that's what I love about this story is he did this unknowingly. Uh, probably built he built such a strong rapport with this group of people that without even asking, these people went out of their way. I don't even know, like, you, do you know from this story that beforehand, if these yacht owners were all already associating with each other, or were they brought together just because of this forum? Um, I don't know. I know that they were all communicating on the same forum, so they knew each other that way, but I don't know if they had a formal entity in place. So that, that, that to me, just, just is amazing, like the, the, um, like the social proof behind all of this. You know, this, this kid is helping them out so much that this group of people who may or may not know each other outside of the forum decides to get together and form a corporation and then hire this kid just for the purpose because he had helped them so much. He had built this rapport so strongly that, that, they, that they really didn't have an option. If they wanted to keep him, they went out of their way to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, just, that just blows my mind. The whole story just kind of blows my mind. It's really, really interesting. And I think that um, from a social engineering angle, that, there's such a great lesson there. Is if you want people to go out of their way to help you, if you want people to go out of their way to, to bend the rules for you, so to say, then make it all about them. Make, make, it, make everything about them. Build that rapport. People will go to great lengths to make sure you get everything that you desire. Well, it's also, I mean, it's the same premise behind open source software, right? Which is if you've got something useful to other people, you can hoard it and prevent them from having it, or you can share it and make sure everyone has it. And if you do that, then everyone benefits. But the side effect is that human beings are built to appreciate that sort of thing. You know, gift economies do exist yep. in the world, and there's a reason for that, and that is that gratitude and reputation do, you know, do play a role. And increasingly, that is the currency online. Is you know, if you write a new tool, you put your name on there and contact information about you, and you help people use it and give it away for free. That in turn, they'll turn around and funnel opportunities to you. Like that's a lot of of what I do is I, I go and give speeches and you know present information to people that otherwise wouldn't get access to this stuff and they turn around and make sure that I have other opportunities to do that for pay and that works out extremely well not by virtue of me saying I will come and talk to you only if you pay my premium amount right instead it's you know hey let me come help you guys out and if you find it useful then say something good about me to someone that can hire me to do something yeah that that that, recip that reciprocation is um, very important I think uh, in business and human, but you know, coming at it from this purpose of this podcast, from a social engineering angle, it's very interesting to me because every time I hear a story um, that is not involving SE, but where this has worked extremely, it always is this way. It always involves someone who went out of their way to make other people feel comfortable or good about themselves or give them something that was extremely valuable to them with no expectation of anything in return. Just doing it because. You know, they felt it was the right thing to do. And the end result was always people stepping up and going out of their way for them. And uh, that always did just, it, no matter how many times I hear a story like this, it still fascinates me because it's the simplest concept. But I think what you were alluding to before is business, business hasn't gotten that yet. Business no. hasn't gotten that. And generally, in general, people don't get that because um, you know, egos, ego suspension is very difficult for, for many, many people to actually – Lower yourself, humble yourself, and then think of others as higher than you. Very difficult for people. Well, I think part of it is that the, I mean the the fundamental premise behind your statement just now is that there is higher and lower in the first place, right? And one of the things that I've always felt is that you know sure sure there's social status, there's financial resource, you know there's all sorts of ways that you can arbitrarily create catalogs and hierarchies, but at the same time it's all interesting, and so. For me, it's much more a matter of what's interesting about you and how can we talk about that so that we learn more interesting things, right? Yeah. Yep. Like I want to go and do cool stuff in the world. What are you doing that's cool? 
that I know nothing about because we can sit here and talk about stuff I already know about, but I already know about it, you know, and beyond feeling like I'm really awesome when you ooh and ah at my achievements, there's the actual real return of learning something new. And that's what's really interesting for me. So I'll give you an example. I was very popular in high school because I was friends with the entire police department in the town that I grew up. And the reason that I was popular with the police department was that I got caught making out with my girlfriend in the graveyard, which we'd <laughs> broken into, right? And, w- and when this happened, you know, obviously the police were not loving it, like stopping, you know, I'm, I don't know how often this happened, but we basically busted the lock and broke into the graveyard and we're making out, right? So they stop us, they take my license, they're running the license. And while they're doing that, I'm like, well, I'm either going to jail or I'm getting a ticket, but either way... I'm sitting here surrounded by, they got me out of the car, right? Because they they wanted to make sure I wasn't raping my girlfriend. And she said, no, no, that's not what he's doing. So that was okay. So we're sitting there for like 10 minutes or whatnot, standing around. And so I start asking them about their gun training and ask them if they've ever played paintball. Because I just went and was playing, I played paintball every weekend with my friends. And they're like, well, yeah, we do it for training. I love love, love paintball, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Throw that that in there. (laughs) Totally, totally with you. So... And I started asking about their guns. I was explaining some of the mods that my friend Lena was making. I was saying, you know, hey, do you ever play down in, in this area of the of the town? And they're like, no, but we, you know, we do once a month get together. We're playing now in this field in such and such a place, but it's not very good. We need a place with more woods. And I was like, well, my friend has a place behind his his house. It has some good spots. You know, why don't you come down at the end of the month? I'll get a bunch of guys together, and we can do like local teenage guys versus the police force. What do you think? And they're like, that'd be great, you know, because we're always playing against ourselves. We want to play with some other people in some new places. Plus, we only have standard issue gear. We want to see what kind of mods you guys are making. And so, I, you know, I'm, this is all while we're in the graveyard, while my girlfriend is in the car getting dressed, more or less. And, and, like, uh, and the police and I are standing out with the lights flashing while they're waiting for my, my license to be run. And we're making this appointment. In the end, they're like, okay, well, we're supposed to give you a ticket for whatever it is an amount. But, uh, you know, if, if we manage to bust, bust your ass this weekend or, you know, at the end of the month when we play, then we can talk about you paying up or not. And we all had a laugh and shook hands. And I went home, called on my friends. We went and played paintball with the police force. We became friends with them. And for the rest of the time that I was a teenager growing up in that town, I never got busted for anything. <laughs> all about them, right? Well, yeah, more, but not even more about them. Just, I, I guess the thing that that my friends found interesting was, and one friend in particular told me this, which was, if I had been caught red-handed, so to speak, you know, by the police, the last thing in my mind would be to ask them about their gun training. But right. for me, that was a, obvious. Like I'm stuck here with these three guys who are sitting around with like stern expressions. It's awkward. No one knows what to say. So talk about something interesting. And it works, right? Obviously. I mean, in your case, it works, but it works in everyday life, too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, have a I mean, really- they, they wanted to talk about it. They thought it was interesting, right? And, that's, and so did I. So we had fun instead of me going to jail, which I thought was a very positive outcome. That is a positive outcome. <laughs> I have a good friend. His name is Tom McIntosh. He's an older guy. He's uh, a world-renowned trombone player. He does uh, plays jazz music. Uh, amazing, amazing jazz player. The, the guy probably is one of the best. Uh, you know, played with all the, the biggies back in the day. And I asked him once um, how he got to be so awesome at it. You know, I said, was it like eight hours of practice a day, or you know, what what was it that made him so awesome? And I was a younger guy at the time, so I didn't really get the concept of what he told me as the answer. But now, you know, I get it now. And he he told me no matter who he met uh, as a jazz musicianist, regardless of of how good or how bad they were in comparison to him, he asked every person for a lesson. So he, he, when he would meet somebody, he would always say to them, "Before you before we leave, can you just show me one thing that you do really good on whatever instrument you play? Can you just give me like one lesson on something you do really good?" And he said, the, 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 the guy who's even just starting out has got something to teach him. And he did that over his career, over decades, and he learned something uh, from everybody. And because of that, he is one of the most world-renowned um, trombone players now that has played on every major jazz album and still teaches 
it, it, the guy is just amazing. And, that, and I attribute it to that, the fact that he is humble enough and willing enough to take a lesson from anybody. Uh, I totally agree. And anybody can do that for anything. I, I mean, I think this is, this is such a fundamental view on how you can do things in life. Like at one point leading up to Christmas, I called my wife and said, I'm not going to make it to dinner. I'm in Harlem. And I can't tell you why, but I'll be home late. And after Christmas, I gave her a scarf that I had knitted for her. And what had happened is I had just got my needles and my yarn and I kind of knew what I was doing. And I got on the subway and was trying to figure it out. And this older black woman sat down next to me and kind of looked at what I was doing and smiled and then looked away. And that's where it normally would have ended, except I turned to her and said, do you know anything about knitting? And it turns out that that's what she did full time. Like when growing up, that's how she made spare money. And then, it, then she raised a bunch of kids and da, da, da. And anyway, she helped me figure out how to knit this scarf and greatly improved my, you know, I don't know how you describe it, but, but I was pretty crap at knitting when I started <laughs> with this woman. But basically, I was supposed to be riding for two stops. I rode with her all the way out to Harlem. We got out. I bought her coffee at a coffee shop. And then I got a, like a two-hour, three-hour lesson of knitting and finally went home and I made huge progress on this scarf. And the scarf, I think, came out pretty well. And, you know, after Christmas, I told my wife all about this and she's like, you know, that is so bloody typical of you, Josh. You're getting on the subway to go home and suddenly now you're in Harlem learning to knit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sweet. So I have a question, which is, I was really interested in the uh, presentation you did in New York, where you talked about basically your wardrobe and how you guys made Excel spreadsheets that change the way you buy things and acquire things and what you keep and what you don't keep. And what I really want to know is, do you find it harder to basically hack yourself than it is to hack other people? Because I find it very easy to modify other people's behavior but not so much my own. Mm. Well, it's a good question. I get. I think it depends on what and how. Like, are you talking about your own bad habits versus other people's, you know, arbitrary behavior, or your arbitrary behavior, or how do you mean? My own, my own bad habits. Like, I have a real tough time. I'm basically almost a hoarder. I, that's why I tell all my friends. And I realized you had to move to Iceland, so you had to get rid of stuff. I mean, literally, you really had to get rid of stuff. And I often tell my friends, it's easier if my house just burned down because then I don't have to worry about it. I can just start all new and know what I used and what I don't and hope that my future behavior won't, you know, fall back into the habit of, well, I can use that. And then you have it. Right, right. <laughs> um, well, so the, the thing that I find difficult about personal habits is that they're really complicated, right? Like you don't hoard things because you like living in a messy apartment. I'm assuming right. you're, hoard you're hoarding things because when you were five, you didn't have as many bottle caps to play with as your friend did. And then when you were nine, your mom said that you could have that extra closet shelf. And then when you were 11, you know, who knows what the long convoluted psychological history is that makes you feel that having all this stuff is a good idea. It's, right. it's pretty usual. Like people are, are predisposed to have more stuff rather than less. You know, a lot of our larger social systems are built on it. What I found useful with that was that my wife, who is better at this than I am, decided that she would design some systems that would reward me for having less versus more. So living out of a backpack, for example, will very quickly train you that as much as you love that big, heavy, thick leather jacket, it's a stupid thing to carry around with you when you can have a soft shell that weighs eight ounces, right? Like. Sure. And after you've carried that around for eight months, and it took me eight months, but after eight months, I finally agreed that the leather jacket, bad idea, right? That was a system that's kind of extreme to, to get yourself put into. There's other systems you can put in place, but your point is a good one in that it's difficult to do that to yourself. Having someone else come along and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to put a reward structure or a punishment structure in place around that behavior is in a lot of ways easier because it kind of steps outside the system of beliefs that you have that formulate that behavior in the first place. You know, we had a guy on the podcast um, <clears throat> that was in a horrible fire, and uh, he, in his recovery process, uh, he got he got really sick, and in his recovery process, um, he got some disease from the hospital. I think it was like hepatitis or something to that effect. I remember the story, uh, and he had to take these shots 
that was going to, that was like a trial that was going to uh, hopefully cure him. But every time he took a shot, uh, it made him violently ill. So, of course, you know, he found himself making excuses to not take the shot, you know, to avoid going and getting it, to taking it himself and things like that. And um, he was getting sicker. So he ended up creating a reward system, is what you just said, for himself, that um, he would reward himself with something that was very special to him, something that he always loved to do, uh, something that just made the day valuable for him. And he would only allow himself to do it if he took the shot. Right. And, and it was, it, it took him a few weeks uh, to get into it, but he had to, you know, eventually retrain himself. And he retrained himself to realize that the reward only came if he took the shot. Right. And, and after a couple of weeks, he was able to retrain himself to do it. And he, you know, in essence, took the medicine and it cured him from his hepatitis. And he, uh, you know, he's still living now today. But it was a really interesting story based on the, kind of what you just said, which is this self rewarding process that helped him to realize uh, what he had to do in order to change his behavior. Right. And there's lots of systems like that are, that are out there now. I mean, I think it's a pretty rich time for applications and platforms that reward that sort of thing. I mean, like with housework, when my wife and I were first living together, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Chore Wars? No. I didn't. So, I don't know about so, those guys. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a simple, a pretty silly thing. It's called ChoreWars.com, and basically some guy designed it for his kids. But you get on there, and you choose a, it's like designed like an MMORPG, right? So you choose, you know, your the picture of your fighter or your your warrior or your priest or whatever it is. And you've got this character picture, and you can go as far as to define attributes for it and whatnot. But really the gist of it is that you as a group of people, whether it's you and your kids or your coworkers or your roommates or you and your wife, whatever, define certain adventures, which are chores, like take out the trash, make the bed, clean the bathroom, whatever it is. And each chore has a certain number of experience points that it rewards you. And then when you and each chore only comes up every so often, right? So you can, can't clean the bathroom three days in a row and not clean it for the next three weeks. <laughs> but w when you do that, you get experience points. And when you log on, the character with the most experience points appears to the farthest left in, on the screen, right? So they're highest up. So now on my wife's birthday, at one point when we were playing this, she got up at six in the morning to clean the litter box so that she would level up ahead of me so she'd be at a higher level than me all day on her birthday. <laughs> like she was so, because me and my wife were pretty competitive. So it turns out that co competitions really work for motivating us. But I mean to get back to your question, in terms of how to change your own behavior, I think it's a matter of experimenting with which sort of behavioral adjustment systems work well for you. So like I said, competition works well for us, reward systems might work well for you. The good news is there's lots of things you can play with. Cool. That's an interesting story about the chore. I never heard of the, the site. Heck yeah. I, I think I would lose constantly if I had to compete against my wife. <laughs> well, I mean, you're pretty much losing against anybody, Chris. Uh, no, not not. That's not true. I'm sure you do nothing around the house. But you know, I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I do, I do some stuff. But I think my wife would definitely obliterate me. She would always be on the top left. Well, time. so you, you need to. So this is interesting. Eventually, what happened is that we we stopped doing it because we started throwing everything else in there to give us an edge. So, like, eventually, I'd be like, you know, taking all these old CDs and converting them from physical medium onto the uh, the backup drive is really time consuming. Don't you think that counts as a chore? <laughs> even, you know, well, even because you are cleaning up the house. Right. Yeah. See, so that counts, right? And she, and so grudgingly, my wife's like, okay, okay. Well, then she'd be like, well, you know, uh, organizing the spice cabinet really is a chore, and I think we ought to get down there. Well, it's nothing I would ever do. So then, she, so then eventually we just had a bunch of chores that were in there that were optimized for us individually, and we were just kind of making an arms race. So we, we called it in, but, in, but the, the upside was that the larger behavior remained, right? Like the house now generally stays pretty clean, without a lot of effort from either of us because we habitually clean it. Uh huh. So you built, you built a new set of rules basically within your, within your own personality that now you do these things without the reward being needed. Right. At least I would say so. I, I would have to check with my wife on her opinion on that one. That's interesting <laughs> though. Yeah. So I mean it's almost like you formed a new habit. Yeah, exactly. Which is probably one of the hardest things 
they say to do, right? Because what's the old rule that it takes like 30 days to build a habit and, and uh, like three seven. to break it or seven to break it, something like that? I think it's seven weeks to make a new habit. Is Seven weeks, okay. But I mean, but I got to believe, you know, honestly, like running five miles every day, it's going to take me more than seven weeks, you know? Um, using less salt, probably not going to take seven weeks. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so depending on, yeah, I, I would imagine that whatever your propensity is for, I agree with that. Yeah, well, that's interesting. That's, uh, but, you know, that's the same system that we use for, like, dog training nowadays. Like, they're like, you know, first you reward, 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 and slowly you wean them off the treats so that you don't have to carry a bag of treats with you every time you want them to sit or heal or, you know, stop barking or whatever it is. And so that's... It's funny how the kind of things that we use for animal training kind of extrapolates up into human training. Yeah, we're not so different, really. Yeah, and, and people will get offended. Um, I mean, not on the podcast, I mean, but people will get offended when you when you say that. But that you know, that's that was what I found interesting about your your research with like the crows or um, you know even even this kind of stuff that we now take it as all the same principles, really a reward mechanism. Right with the crows, it was if you find this particular item that I'm looking for, you get rewarded. And with with you and your wife, it was you know if you do take this particular action, then you get rewarded. You know, <laughs> and it's the yeah. same exact concepts, just wholly different. Uh, you know, tying that into kind of like a social engineering point of view. Um, you know, we don't have normally in an engagement, you don't have weeks to build a new uh, set of internal rules for your target. Let's say. You know, you can't you can't go and build like a, a set of new philosophies or actions over seven week period. Um, so you have to do this in a quick, a very quick kind of manner. You know, where you're you're working with this person, um, and a reward can be something even more simplistic. Maybe you know, it's just recognition. Um, it's I think it kind of ties into maybe how you did that with your mom and dad, with with email. You know, if your dad responded in a way that you were trying to train him not to respond in. You did not respond to him. That's a right. very quick way to kind of learn. Oh well, you know, my wife got a response from my son. Well, how did that happen? Oh well, I I, I amped him. You know, right. and then he, oh well, maybe I tried that. Then he tries it and you respond. So it's like oh well, that's the way we get a hold of of Josh is just through I am. Well, the the flip side of that is that you can look at the systems that people have already been trained to and exploit them. Right. So like one of my favorites is if you're on the cell phone. People are trained not to question what you're doing, right? So if I'm walking up to a door and fumbling around for my, you know, key pass, people are trained to open the door for me. Uh, yep. Right? Because that's really, that's polite. And they're also trained not to ask me what I'm doing there because I'm on the cell phone. So you take those two behaviors, match them together, and suddenly you've got people that let you into buildings you have no reason getting into. And I think that, that you don't have to train people to do useful behaviors as much as you need to recognize the useful behaviors that they're already trained to do. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think the cell phone thing is an interesting um, point because when you, when you look at um, a cell phone allows you a lot of personal freedom. You know, if you're standing at an ATM or you're standing at a, any kind of vending machine or something where you're putting in numbers or your credit card, if I'm standing right behind you and kind of looking over your shoulder, you obviously feel uncomfortable about that. It makes me it makes me look creepy. But if I'm talking on my cell phone and I just happen to be wandering closer to you, all of a sudden personal space becomes less as important uh, because I'm doing something else. You you assume I'm distracted enough talking to whoever I am that that lack of personal space is is as important as it was as if I was focused on you. Right. Yeah. It's 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 a real. I've I've, I've done a little bit of reading on that, and then we've done some. Uh, I don't want to say studies because it wasn't really a study, but just kind of testing that theory out. I do find that really interesting. So, um, Josh, if if people wanted to find out more about you, you know, the things that the speeches that you've given, or or the um, the the writings that you've done, the book that you have written, where can they go to find out more about you? Uh, probably the website Josh uh, okay. is the best place to go. Simple enough. And uh, if anyone wants to find your TED speeches, I know I found them on YouTube. Uh, they had a TED speech up there, but I think you have links on your on your site to all of your different writings and speeches and articles that you have out there, right? Yeah, I think there's a, a page called Speaking that'll list a bunch of them. I mean, yeah, if you're if you're curious, there's plenty of stuff there. Excellent, excellent. Um, and it, do do you have a Twitter account people can follow you on, or any kind of social media? A lot of our 
a lot of our listeners like to like to join and follow people once they hear them talk if they find what you're saying interesting. Definitely, yeah. It's Joshua Klein. Um, so at Joshua Klein, check it out. There's another guy named Josh Klein <laughs> who writes about social media and whatnot, and he's he's pretty popular. I gotta say, uh, a lot of people think that I am him. <laughs> I don't know if he, I don't know if the inverse is true, but like I said, as I long got as the he exact keeps- same problem, man. I got, I got a Dave Kennedy that's in the security field. That's in information security. Yeah, well, but, that, but that Dave Kennedy actually is interesting. So, <laughs> well, I was going to say, as long as that other Dave Kennedy is uh, is is more popular and uh, and saying more interesting things, and it's good. As once that other Josh Klein starts making me look bad, we're going to have to have hard work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part will be if he comes out with some research or a paper, and then you're giving a speech one day, and someone starts asking you about. So that paper you wrote, you know, and it has nothing to do with anything you wrote. It's like the other Josh Klein wrote it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't have to deal with that problem with the name like Chris had Nagy. There's not too many of us out there, so. You lucky devil. And, and rightfully, and, and good for the world, by the oh, way. Oh, man, thank God for the world. I'm with you. Yeah. One of me is more than enough. I completely agree with that. <laughs> I, I can't argue with you, Dave. Can't argue with you. Did you um, disagree with me again? I, I did. I agree with you. Hey, when it comes to those kind of things. All right. Uh, okay, so we got your Twitter, we got your website, um, maybe uh, your book. What's the name of your book? Uh, well, there, I wrote a sci-fi novel a while back that's Creative Commons. You can read that. That's rude, R-O-O apostrophe D. And I wrote a business book called Hacking Work, and it's all about the, this concept of breaking, breaking stupid rules and big bureaucracies in order to improve not only your employment but the, the bureaucracy as a whole. Excellent. I really appreciate your time here today, Josh. Um, really interesting stuff. And thanks for the research you're doing, too. We look forward. Hopefully, you'll get a, a deal on your next book. It sounded like a cool topic that a lot of people might enjoy. So we look forward to seeing that. Let us know how that comes out, and we'll promote it for you. Sounds good. Thanks so much for taking the time. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Man. Adios. Bye. Okay, so, well, another good podcast. Uh, really glad Josh was able to come on. Um, I'm sure we'll be checking out his book. I didn't read the book beforehand, but I was checking it out before the podcast because um, I got turned on by uh, to him. You got, by, you got turned on by what? By all of his TED speeches that I saw. and the Turned different, on? Turned on in a way to uh, – not like that, Dave. But you just said turn on. I'm just, expl- I'm just explaining there, what you said. There's a lot of ways to be turned on. I got my mentally turned so, on. So there's a lot of ways to be turned on? Oh, man. PG, Dave. PG. Okay, sorry. You know, not everything has to go that direction. I, listen, you're the one that said turn on, dude. I'm just quoting what you said. Don't, <laughs> don't get all mad at me. I'm not mad. I just find it amazing that I could say anything and you'll turn it to <gasps> some Why kind of... Why do your brains keep going there? Mine doesn't. Dave, don't say your brains. Dave's brain. I was all fine saying the word turned on without turning it to a sexual connotation, but Dave cannot do that. Listen, I can't help it if you said the word turn on. Like, what else am I supposed to take it on? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, so hey, I was walking down the street and I was turned on by this car that was walking past or driving past me. You just don't use that in that context. You know. What do you say you know for? It's true. Uh, any. New poll. New, new poll. <laughs> no, no, I got a poll I'm working on that's going to finally take away the uh, who's better in SE women polls, that trust study. That I, I got a lot of nice feedback. So I, I'm actually going to do this. I'm actually going to do my first real study. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a real, actual scientific study, and we're going to use the poll for that. I've, I've asked people through Twitter to send me pictures of themselves, non-goofy posts, just everyone kind of sitting and smiling or not smiling. And I'm going to put these pictures up there and ask people to vote uh, if they would trust that person based on the way they look, yes or no. And then we're going to – we have a certain set of criteria – for the picture and the person, and then we're going to rate it, and then we'll release what all of that criteria is afterward. I don't want to. Do you have, re- a, do you have a specific criteria for the people and the person that we're going to about releasing the criteria? What? <laughs> I was going to. No, well, actually, you make a good comment because remember when you asked me about for my picture and I said, yeah, but I'm Asian. And unless you have other Asian females, it's going to not really be necessarily. I mean, you should have. I don't want to. I hate this term, other people of color. Like, if you put a black guy on there, do you know how much racial profiling people still do? Oh, like, yeah. I think they says like 80% of the population still uses racial profiling in A the back tons. of their mind. I, this is the thing. This is the reason I haven't released the study yet. I want more pictures. I have a, two or three people who really helped me out. They went through their offices. They got everyone to agree. They took pictures and sent them to me. But so I, how many people are you doing? Um, let's see. Right now, I can actually tell you in a moment if you give me a 
33, 32 pictures. And, How many do you want? Well, I, you know, I'd like to have more diversity, like what you said. I'd like to have people of different cultural backgrounds and skin colors. Um, right now, I only have a, a couple. Um, but I'd, I'd love to have people from different cultures. So I'm putting this out on the podcast in a hope that maybe by May we can launch the study. But people, I think the big problem came in is as soon as people heard what I was asking, they're like, I don't know if I trust you with my picture. <laughs> and and I understand that, you know, definitely coming from where we're at. But I'm trying to tell people that there's to be no names, no identifying information on the pictures. Nobody will know who you are or what your details are. It's merely based on this face, do you trust this person? And, uh, and and I think it will be interesting to determine, you know, if someone who would be considered scientifically attractive. So when I say that, I mean what science has proven that most people view as attractive, like a symmetrical face, smaller features, things like that. If they get um, voted as being trusted more than those who have um, an asymmetrical, you know, or not scientifically attractive appearance, or something to that effect. Gotcha. Um, you know, it will be interesting. You, you, you lost me like ten minutes ago, but keep going. Yeah, no problem. I, I, we lost you probably like an hour ago, but that's okay. The, um, the you know, so I, I'm hoping that through this we can kind of get some more people to send their pictures in. You know, send their pictures in to us, so we can we can complete that trust study. What are you doing, Dave? I was about to say, why don't you? That's not me, by the way. I'm on mute. 100% of the entire time, so don't even, don't even give me that. I can actually say for 100% reasonable shadow of a doubt that wasn't me this time. So eat it. Eat it. <laughs> Why is it all about you? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting blamed all the time, damn it. Oh, I, can, I, I can honestly say that was not me because I was on mute that entire time. You know, even and I heard, if, the, I heard the scratching on my side, so I know it wasn't me. Even if it was Ping, I'm blaming you. <laughs> because I think you, it was made, ping. you made Ping. It was do Ping. It. You it mean, was it was me and my dog, my super bee. Ah, well, you know, if it's a dog, it's okay. We like dogs. So I'd like to have an apo- a, a, a formal apology from you, Chris. Thank yeah. you. There's no apology owed to you because no, you no, just there definitely right is an apology. Why, oh no, there's an you apology. Just went right to having it being about you, Dave. I'm I'm sorry that I blamed you, even though 99 percent of the time it is your fault, and this one percent it was not. I'm sorry that I assumed that it was your fault for this time. Apology accepted. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. You accepted his apology, even though there's that disclaimer. Yes. Yeah, it's, I know that's as best as I'm going to think it was. So I just went with it. What I, is that whatever. beeping? You guys that is, that? That's got to be him. That is definitely. That, what are you talking? What beeping? You, you didn't hear it? Like in the middle of your thing, it sounded like you were playing a, um, um, like a sound effect. Like it and went, that was the second time too. Yeah, it went. Oh, I accept his apology. That's like, like that. That's what happened. Well, I don't. I don't know where that, where that came from. I mean, that could be me. It's probably your stinking headset because even though you're like the CSO or whatever of a Fortune 1000 company, you can't afford like a good headset. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I know you know. <laughs> Anyhow, I guess we got enough on Josh. You, you can check out his links on the URLs that he put out there on Twitter if you want to follow him. Uh, anything else we got to talk about in closing? Any new news on Derby that you need to release, uh, Dave? Yes, you actually made a commitment, Chris. You want to talk about this? Yeah, I'm. I'm actually. I'm really excited about it. So, so you are now um, going to be speaking at DerbyCon, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, speaking and doing a course, or a one day, right? A one day. Yes, day. speaking and doing a course at DerbyCon. So that's huge, man. It's huge news. I'm, I'm excited. I really I'm excited am. for you. Yeah, I really am. I, last year, I was really bummed that I missed it. Um, I'm being serious. I was. I was what do you mean? You mean you mean bailed out the last minute? That yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really bummed that that happened. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. But uh, this year, that's not going to happen. So no, I'm excited, man. Seriously, I mean, it's going to be a great lineup, and I mean, it just keeps getting better. And uh, obviously, with you coming aboard, uh, we're really looking forward to it. So we'll definitely have more news as um, it comes along. Uh, but we also have been having um, some some great success with sponsors. We had um, Singress and Paul.com announced. Uh, we just announced that they they're a silver sponsor. And nice. um, by the time this podcast is released, uh, Akivant is going to be a gold sponsor. Uh, so we're getting more and more sponsors, and the conference is really shaping up. That really excited. Nice. nice. Yeah. And it's September. That is September. September twenty seventh is the training. The twenty eighth, twenty ninth, and thirtieth is um the actual conference itself and uh there'll be a little bit of uh training in the morning on the 28th as well so when um when do the tickets go on sale tickets go on sale may 4th okay so that's coming up really yeah 
And what, what I can say is I'll, I'll give a little bit of a leak um, since it will, since it'll be on the the June episode. We're, um, what is it? When is it being released? Uh, this will be April. Um, April, yeah. yeah. Um, we're gonna actually do an early ticket sale for about a hundred tickets, um, and I want everybody to slam the limiting daylights out of the web server because I want to see and make sure that um, the new sy- ticketing system that I, I built um, actually works. So we'll probably open it up a week or two early just for a hundred tickets. And just to see how how well the servers can handle. So if you don't get a ticket, don't get bummed. I mean, there'll be plenty plenty of tickets for people. We just want to make sure that um, you know when we actually open up, it's not a huge debacle. So yeah, that's smart. Do a little like like beta testing on the ticket system. Well, it's a brand new system, you know, and and we just want to make sure you know I, it is written right. And of course, I I wrote it, so I'm sure there's going to be some major issues with oh it. Oh my gosh, yeah, totally mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> Probably buggy as heck. Okay, now that you announced that, no one's putting their credit cards into that site anymore. <laughs> well, the, cre- the credit cards I don't actually handle, nor will I ever handle, so you don't have to worry about that. Oh, good, good. I don't ever Oof. want to touch that in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, smart. Smart. So, derbycon.com, right? Derbycon.com. Yeah, that's awesome. So, they could check that out. Anything else you got, Peng? You want to? Uh, the call, uh, yeah, actually, the Black Hat call for papers, uh, the official opening date is April 1 for USA, and it's closing on May 15th, and I know everyone likes to wait. I'm To be honest with you, about 20% of our su- uh, submissions get submitted, like, the day of, day before. You really, really, really need to get it in early because we're doing rolling submissions, and uh, if you wait till the end and you cry and moan and groan that your presentation was oh so wonderful but we didn't give you slots probably because we get 500 submissions and there's only 90 slots mm-hmm. i'll be wow. submitting mine i got i got to talk to them smitten 500 submissions At really le- yeah last year was 541 and you got to read every single one of them i don't personally read every single one of them. i do read every single one that gets accepted or that gets put on the short list so there's so, a group of people though that have to read every 541 of them Yes, the review board. But they do divvy it up because, you know, if you're not – if you have no cryptography background, then you're not going to look at the cryptography right. submissions. But since most of them are not cryptography and they tend to be more broad-based, I would say the review board probably does touch about 90 – 75 to 90 percent of them. Wow. Every one of them. That's crazy though. I mean you're talking like 500 and some submissions. You've got to read them and then out of that you've got to try to keep your facts straight and determine which would be the best for the only it's, 90 slots you have. It's super intense, so that's why I also su- suggest doing it earlier because, believe me, if it were you and you had the six weeks to be reviewing mm. submissions as they come in at the end, how would you be? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that guy that, that guy just ticked me off, and I'm not taking his speech for anything. Right. It's like typos, forget it. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, yeah, oh, you can't I can't spell understand. spell you. <laughs> right, exactly. No outline, never mind. And oh, submissions man. with white papers will be always be looked at more closely than those without. The more supporting stuff people send in. But, yeah, I mean, towards the end there, it's really rough. Yeah, It's I really, imagine. really rough. Wow, that's a little – yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So good good advice. Get them in early. And when, when is the exactly. closing date again? May 15th. Oh, and so you, you only can, have like a month from when this podcast comes out, really. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, blackhat.com, there's a link for CFP. It will be up there on April one. A month, Blackhead.com, guys. Blackhead.com. One Get month. There now, a month. Exactly. Do we it. used to run it. Yeah, we used to run it longer, but again, it just became you know so few in the beginning, and then everyone packing it at the end. So we just for like, well, I mean, if someone's got research and they're willing to post it, it doesn't really matter if you do it if you if you compress the time frame for them to be able to post. Man, it's crazy. Um, it's cra- it is crazy. So we got a. It's very, it's very cool too, by the way. Oh, cool. Real cool. Cool. It's very cool. <laughs> cool. That's my word of the day, by the way. Word of the day. What's your word cool. of the day? Because you said cool like 400 different 30 times. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, cool, cool that I said that. Yeah, yeah it's cool. cool. Yeah, it's cool. I got a video that we're going to be posting on a little promotion for, uh, cool. for the class. It is. I was inspired by you, Dave. Oh, yeah? I was inspired. It's cool. I, I, made, I made a video out of iMovie. I'll pass yeah. it to you so you can see it. I'll pass it to yeah. you. I want, I want your input. But, um, yeah, for sure. Because, you know, after when you made that one for Derby, I was like, I thought you actually had it professionally done. So that's, yeah, how, no. that's how good it came out. And then yeah. you were telling me I moved me. I never played with the thing. And uh, I, I booted it up and started messing with it. And Peng was kind of saying, you need to really make a video to promote this class. And I spent a couple of days doing it. And really, I think it came out great. Is this your Black Hat class? Yeah, for the yeah. Black Hat class. Oh, that's cool. I, I just did one too for the black light class. It's, it's better than yours. It, it might really. Be. <laughs> it, it, it might be better, but you know what that means, um, Pink, is he didn't do one, and now that he heard my idea, he's going to go do one. 
Exactly. Everything. I was just about to say, why is it all about him again? Yeah. <laughs> I did one too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't doing that competitively. I was just saying I'm excited about it. That will be on the site and it will be on that's YouTube. That's cool. Oh, seriously, that's, that's that's really cool. Black Hat will be promoting it. Um, keep in mind, uh, Dual Core. If you really like the song, check it out on his site, DualCoreMusic.com. Are you gonna send that to us yet? By the way. Yeah, I'm, as soon as we, uh, as soon as I'm done with the recording, I'll pass it to you guys so I don't kill the Skype connection. I'll pass it to you. Ping's so are you gonna are you gonna, are you gonna get that to us? I mean, seriously. Ping's favorite way of passing things is through Skype. I despise it. I don't even. I don't even understand. <laughs> she loves me. <laughs> um, <laughs> or not. Or not. But you know. Yeah. Or, or not. Or not. But maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you can check us out on social-engineer.org or social-engineer.com. On Twitter, we're on the irc.freenode.net network on channel social-engineer. On Twitter, human hacker. Uh, keep uh, the submissions coming in, guys. We really love all the feedback and newsletter articles that you're sending in. And if you want to be part of the trust study, email us at contribute at social-engineer.org. Um, also, remember, guys, our goal is to beat Dave in the sign-ups for the class. <laughs> so uh, right now we're doing a great job at that. I just got to hit 20 before he hits any real number. So come on, eight more people. Eight more people. That's all I need. Come on, guys. And then you get free stuff from Dave. Free stuff from Dave. So anyhow, until next time, I'll see you guys in the UK. Talk to you later. Peace. Peace. Like I'm in a hurry. Like I've got work to do. Like I'm going places. Welcome one and all to this fun competition. Except nobody knows if there's any opposition. Face so friendly, smile disarms. Everything's good, no cause for alarm. Cause I'm like you, and likewise the same. But for you, this is work, and for me, it's a game. Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying. Next round starting, believe that I'm. Ah, no signal, my battery is finished. Hey, could I go and use your phone for a minute? Thanks, yo. I had to make a call to play it down while my root kit expelled your data to the cloud. Pain to stall, stand to pause, gotta take my time. Scanning all your systems, the ones you didn't wipe. Scamming y'all. I got terabytes of drives. Cannonball in the dumpster when I dive. Black and white, all the info with the details. And what type of person really prints out emails? Still intact, all the sentences and questions. I mean, paper shredders really aren't that expensive. Yep, we want it all. The kit and caboodle. It's not that impressive. I just know how to Google. Found the CEO with the social network name, sir. Nope, it's dual core. We're just leveraging the framework. Welcome one and all to this fun competition. Except nobody knows if there's any opposition. Face so friendly, smile disarms. Everything's good, no cause for alarm. Cause I'm like you, and likewise. It's the same, but for you this is work, and for me it's a game Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying Next round starting, believe that I'm playing Welcome one and all to this fun competition Except nobody knows if there's any opposition Face so friendly, smile disarms Everything's good, no cause for alarm Cause I'm like you, and likewise the same But for you this is work, and for me it's a game Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying If you know, if you, if you know what I'm saying competition except nobody knows if there's any opposition face so friendly smile disarms everything's good no cause for alarm cause i'm like you and likewise the same but for you this is work and for me it's a game give a thumbs up if you know what i'm saying next round starting believe that i'm playing Thumbs up if you know what I'm saying.